Well, thank you guys for coming today and thank you online folks for being here. Um, I know this is time out of your busy days, so I appreciate uh, your time. And um, I just want to give a big shout out to the library for having me come out. Uh, this is great. I, I look forward to this. Um, I enjoy doing this a little bit more than I enjoy grading papers. I've done both. Um, so it's just being, it's just nice to be able to deliver something and then kind of like uh, uh, not so much worry about the results. So um, as I said, this is Applied Principles in Software Engineering. My name is Matt Borja. If you don't already know me, I'm Web Services Manager here at Yavpi College. Um, and I could definitely go into a lot of the different hard skills that is necessary on our jobs. Uh, but as has been mentioned already, um, I've been programming since about 2002. Um, so that's a lot of ground to cover. That's a lot of years to, to be in the field to try to pack concisely into this. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, over those years, I've observed a number of things. Things are changing all the time. Technology changes, education requirements change, projects change, tasks change, companies even change as we, you know, pivot around and, and continue to pursue our, our careers. But I found that there's a handful of things that don't change. Uh, whether that's in life, whether that's in occupation. And those things that for me have not really changed, if anything, they become more refined, they become more defined in my life, in my occupation especially, um, have kind of formed this, what I call modus operandi for myself that looks something a little bit along the lines of learning the tools that I need to learn, that I should learn, and learning the environments that I need to learn and should learn in order to deliver the biggest impact in order to make the best difference I possibly can. And the reason I say it that way is because as we're gonna use uh, a lot of the similar terms in this lecture here today, um, there, it's very important to, to employ these qualifying criteria to be very explicit about our intent, explicit about our process, explicit about our objectives, our goals, what we're working towards. And so for me, it's not enough to just make a difference um, in the world. I want to make the best difference I possibly can. It's about improving. It's about, um, even as we say, say here at the college, you know, quality matters as we're going to uh, dive into. So I've run this lecture a number of times already. I'm having a hard time cramming it into one hour already as it is. So uh, throughout the slides, there are these QR codes that you'll be able to scan. Um, this is a QR code to, directly to the presentation, the live one that, that I'm using right now. Um, a number of slides I had to drop out of this already to get this to fit. Um, but um, I'm told that if I don't make too many people mad, they might have me back uh, in the fall for part two, which is going to basically be all the slides that I removed out of here. So um, just know we're going to go fast, but hopefully uh, not too fast. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, review these slides, review the recording um, and, um, you know, fi find some application here. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick step back to kind of reset, clear the playing field. What is software engineering? As I speaking with Tom um, right here uh, just earlier, there is a difference between a developer and an engineer, okay? Uh, defined by the University of Nevada, Reno there, they say of software engineering that it encompasses concepts, principles, theories, techniques, and tools that can be used for developing high quality professional software. All right, high quality professional software is the objective for this lecture, is the objective of software engineering. So we have to use, we have to, I mean, this has to be like our uh, prized held objective as we go through this lecture, because if high quality professionalism or high quality professional software is not your goal, then really, honestly, truly, the rest of this lecture is not going to be a, a lot of value to you. Okay. And so necessarily, if this is our goal, then it becomes necessary to, for us to employ a systematic, disciplined approach to software development. Okay, fundamentally, this is the difference between a developer and an engineer is that software engineering is not so much about writing code and building applications as it is about thinking about the design process, about the architecture uh, of a solution, um, about the impact that the changes that you make have on other systems in other areas. So an application engineer as defined by San Diego State University states that uh, their role is to design and improve the software. Other duties might include developing custom software or evaluating client needs to implement unique goals within each project. But professionals, 
must remain a step ahead to plan and implement updates or expansions. And so it's about taking software development to another level of quality, to another level of improvement or, you know, constantly improving. That's the role of the engineer. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and dive into one of those engineering principles that we find uh, here. And this comes from Robert C. Martin's uh, solid principles, object oriented design principles called SOLID. And that letter S there, it's an acronym. SOLID is an acronym. And we're just looking at the first one here. Letter S stands for single responsibility. Okay, single responsibility states that a class should have one and only one reason to change. Meaning that a class, which is a, again, a programming term or concept uh, in object oriented programming, it means that that class should have only one job. Okay, now um, again, links to other resources uh, beyond this lecture, outside the scope of this lecture, that's a link to his Wikipedia page. He's also, I don't know if any of you know him by this other name, Uncle Bob. Um, I don't, but that's also what he's uh, commonly known for. He is known for, um, uh, and most recognized as Wikipedia tells us, for developing many software design principles and also for being a founder in the influential Agile Manifesto for software development, which also outlines for us, if you continue those, those leads and uh, research or look up the Agile Manifesto that we try to employ in our uh, line of work, it lists things not so much having to do with writing code again or building applications as it does have to do with individuals and interactions, prioritizing individuals and interactions over processes and tools, prioritizing working software over comprehensive documentation, prioritizing customer collaboration over contract negotiation, prioritizing responding to change over following a plan. So again, once we're, we're once again, we're kind of taking our, our day-to-day -day practice as developers uh, to another level of quality when we get into this area of, of engineering. We're more concerned with these higher level principles that, that are important and they're going to have a great, greater impact on our work, both in uh, the quality of our work, the, the value goes up, uh, these different types of things. And so let's take a look at an example of single responsibility principle applied in a day-to-day -day developer's job. Here we have a custom application called the Forms app. Now, um, this is just kind of the opening signature line of what you would expect to see in an object-oriented uh, application, if you will. And uh, Forms app is this idea of you know, again, it's custom. It's an in-house application, and you might imagine there are features like you know, creating forms, editing forms, publishing forms, sending those out as links, making them accessible as links, um, saving data, creating data, you know, uh, collecting submission data, reporting on that, all these different types of things. And over the course of the development, as is usually the case, we find better ways to write certain things. You saw up there uh, a little bit of refactoring going on where we find better ways to write some things and make things more concise, make things more readable, make things more usable. Um, and so, and, and also, as you saw, some of the delays there, some things obviously take more time than others to implement. Okay. And this is a pretty uh, fully featured application at this point. We have get data, we have save data. Um, as you can imagine, you know, um, just these are just capabilities that this application has. Uh, get user, authorize user, create user, render page, and download report. Okay. So um, one just a side note, you know, this helps uh, to this sort of naming convention. Uh, helps to be self-descriptive. We try to shoot for some what are called self-documenting uh, code or naming conventions. Um, again, if you are just a developer trying to get through the day, trying to get to five o'clock and you're really not invested into, you know, the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, naming conventions aren't going to be something that you, that you wake up excited, looking forward to. Okay. Um, usually naming conventions are things that uh, have a broader impact, have a broader, broader uh, uh, reach to them. There's a reason for them. Um, and usually it's, it's on the scale when you've started to scale out your operation and you need things to start following a certain pattern of consistency uh, so that it's easier to deploy changes on a much broader 
broader scale. And so for things to follow certain conventions, it enables an organization to scale out their products, scale out their operations. So we try to follow some form of convention, even if we're not looking to scale this out, um, we try to practice these principles because um, we know that this is ultimately contributing toward that, once again, that objective of high quality professional software. Now, this is not exactly, uh, does not exactly exemplify single responsibility principle. What we need to do is start identifying how we can apply this principle by grouping or, or identifying similar methods here um, that can, can sort of represent that one job. So this is a proposal of how you can apply single responsibility to this application on the left. This is not the only way to do it, but just using simple color coding, I'm proposing a way to apply that to this application. And that's simply looking at the method names, following that convention, it's easy to see. I've got two methods here that are related to data, operating on data, getting data, saving data. I've got three methods here having to do with users, uh, getting users, authorizing users, creating uh, users, registration, for example. And then I have here at the bottom two sort of outliers. Um, they're still kind of distinct from each other. Um, I don't really have enough samples of these to justify, you know, some kind of grouping, uh, if you will. And so I can do one of two things at this point. Um, if I'm still interested in pursuing that higher quality uh, grade is I, I could, it's okay if I go ahead and leave these in here in the parent class container. So the forms app where it currently is today, um, I could choose to leave it in there right now until I have more samples uh, to, to then later refactor as we call it. Or I could search for something that's maybe a little bit more specific than forms app, but not too specific where I have like a, a, an entire class dedicated for just one single method, like a page class kind of thing. And so um, that's, that's kind of a balancing act. This is a little bit more art than it is, you know, just, just following a, you know, the a, a coded process, if you will. And so, this is a good start in, in this direction of applying this. Again, not the only way to do it, but it is a way to do that. And so um, to, to kind of wrap this up, okay, we can see very simply, I've just extracted those similar methods out into their own separate classes. So now going back to that definition of single responsibility principle, which state that there should only be one reason for that class to change or that that class should have only one job. We can see now just by naming the data class is responsible for data operations, data jobs. The users class is responsible for user operations, users, user related specific jobs and so forth. Uh, this last one here is view, which again is, is a little bit more specific than just the, name of the application, it is handling the view on the client side, meaning uh, there are different ways that we can deliver an, an application to a user. It, it may be through a web page view, uh, an interactive view that you can do queries and pull reports and paginate through records, or you could download a report like a CSV uh, that you can then open up into, a, a, um, into Excel and, and do some additional transformations there. All right, so this is... Um, Again, just a very simple kind of deep dive look into something. And, and, and this is really, um, you know, it's a minimum viable product. There's a lot more we could do with this, but this is just kind of a preview of some of the things that we, that we work with, okay? Now, as principles are, they are generally more wide reaching and more widely applicable than just software engineering. And what I've told several people here uh, over the past couple of weeks is that the reason I titled this Applied Principles in Software Engineering is because a lot of these principles did not necessarily originate in software engineering. Rather, and more uh, uh, to the point, these are principles that software engineering benefits from when we choose to follow these. And also as becoming principles, we oftentimes will use the word should, not must. So not in terms of this is mandatory, you must do this, although we also do uh, uh, provide those guidances. But a lot of times there, there are times when we can't implement a particular principle, we can't follow a certain guide, guideline. But when we can, we need to and we ought to, we should, because what, again, is the objective for that? It's high quality professional software, okay? If that is your goal, then um, you ought to 
do put in basically, as I, as I tell people, you ought to be willing to put in the effort required to produce the results that you demand or that is being demanded of you. Okay. Now those principles uh, we see in other areas of, of our world of, of life itself here, the single responsibility principle can be found even in Mary Kondo's materials or concepts, how, who is the lady who teaches us how to fold our clothes or to clean up our house when we've long since abandoned the way our parents told us to do it. And uh, here comes this, this leader in the industry saying, hey, you need to fold your clothes and here's an efficient way to do it. Um, and so uh, this, this is some pretty good stuff here. I'm not going to go into the, the video here, the time signature, but um, if you were to follow these, uh, this is, again, that time signature would take you to a YouTube video. It's not Mary Kondo, but it is a content creator who's kind of repurposing her stuff. And what it shows you as you, as you watch this, this is like two minutes, 30 seconds. Um, she talks about organizing our houses by purpose, not by room. Okay. And it's kind of funny because as I was watching this, there was a segment in the video where it showed how the laundry was all color coded like organized by color coding. I'm like, okay, it's the same idea. So just kind of give you my, my own personal life example here with this application of this is let's, you know, at, at my house, I have one room uh, dedicated to my office slash studio. And uh, so it's a multi-purpose room, but when it comes time for me to clean up, Okay, or reassemble my studio, for example. Um, and there's lots, a lot, lot of different things that, that can go into that. You know, if you have a studio, you might have a piano, you might have guitars, you might have your amps, you might have your cables, your headphones, you know, these different things. Um, you might have your grand piano, but, you know, that's, that's for some of you more, you know, cooler people. Um, I don't have one of those, so that's not applicable. But um, when it comes time for me to assemble my, reassemble my studio, what I found was kind of interesting about this is I'll go to other rooms and begin removing from those rooms studio equipment that had somehow made it their way into those other rooms and bring them back to my studio, right? And organize it. This is pretty straightforward to, un to understand. But let me just ask you this. What is happening in those other rooms as I am assembling my studio? It's getting cleaned up. It's being decluttered. Things are being removed from those rooms. And I'm not even there to organize those rooms. I'm not there to clean up those rooms. I'm focusing on assembling my studio. And somehow there's content being removed from these other rooms that it sort of has this somewhat of a com compounding effect that these other rooms are being cleaned up by virtue of me focusing on this one purpose, the purpose and the job of my, of my studio. Um, in practice, what that looks like is, again, as I said, it's a multi-purpose room. It has my office stuff as well as my, as my studio. And so for me, if I'm like really trying to practice this principle, that means that on my desk, I am removing from this pile of pencils, my headphones, putting it up, but I'm leaving the pencils where, they're, where they are right now on purpose. I am not here to organize my office at this time, I'm here to organize strictly my studio. And I need that discipline because I know myself that I'm going to get distracted very, very easily. And before you know it, I'm doing 50 other little things like that all around the house because one thing relates to the next and my studio is not being assembled. And so focusing on doing one thing at a time is obviously uh, critically important, but it's that, and we'll get to this again. Um, it's that discipline. It's uh, that principle in, in play. And so just again, to underscore the point that these are principles we have, we see and benefit from in, in engineering and in development, but they do reach further than just within the confines of the little rooms that they put us in, in the back room there. Uh, and, and don't let us out until we're done coding, right? So let's take a look at some of these more higher level principles. Um, this slide here is sort of a reflection of a time when my kids used to live at the house and I would 
show them how to make their beds and say, you guys, you know, here's how you, I want you to make your beds. And um, this is kind of like the, the, the model. And so um, they did that. And one of my, one of my kids, my middle, he, the best way I know how to describe this is, is that he seemed to always have this heart for excellence. And I don't think I taught that to him. It's just something that he always did. I could show him how to make his bed and he would do it that way every single time. And like, I wouldn't have to even check up on it. He just, he just did it. He just ran with it um, and did it very consistently. The others, you know, they needed some, some additional help along the way. But something that I noticed as time went on is that the time to return or the time that it took for them to make their beds and to come out and say, I'm done, became shorter and shorter and shorter. And what I found out was as I would go in to inspect my middles, his bed would be made just the way I laid it out to spec and the other two, you know, more or less with maybe some slight variation. And we go in and make corrections, but I noticed that that time started to compress. They were getting better at, they were getting good at what they were practicing. And as we say in life in, with our kids or with our own work, with co you know, even as coaches, practice makes perfect. But again, as I said earlier, that in, in an effort as, as if high quality is our goal, our objective, then we tend to reach for more explicit terms. We tend to use reach for more qualifying criteria to be clear about our expectations. Because if a child is practicing making their bed the wrong way, that time is being compressed. They're getting good at making it the wrong way. They're becoming efficient. They're becoming proficient at making it the wrong way. Okay. And so I had to sit down with them at a point in time. And I say, look, look, here's what's going on. You will perfect what you practice. You will get good at what you practice. Okay. Um, this was supposed to fade in, but I uh, stepped over it. Whether that's taking shortcuts, whether that's being easily offended, easily annoyed, whether that's being contentious, whether that's being stubborn, being uncooperative, being distracted, being unengaged, being unmotivated, procrastinating, uh, uh, evasion, whether that's practicing purporting results, whether that's practicing accepting appearance, these are things we become efficient at. The more we practice them, the more we even as decision makers and hiring managers practice accepting these things. And this is where the bar begins to fluctuate based upon where we set the standard, what we are willing or not willing to accept. Inversely or conversely, however you want to look at it, you practice due diligence, you will become good at due diligence. You practice attention to detail, you become good at attention to detail. You practice kindness, you practice humility, you practice generosity, you practice transparency. These are things you become good at. You practice, and, and the, the whole, um, this is a compound concept here, but it's so important because these things aren't, aren't things that we necessarily enjoy practicing. And I get that. But the whole point to practice is for that time to compress, for us to become efficient in doing the things that we don't really care for as much. So that we're not so much affected by the things that we don't want to do, even though it's necessary and important for us to do it anyways. We practice it to get through that grind for it to become absorbed into our beings for us to get good at it so that we can focus on naturally, almost as it were, by muscle memory, producing high quality professional output without hardly thinking about it. And before you know it, you're following protocol and you're following your sensitive data obligations and you're following your regulatory compliance obligations and you're following your massive checklist without hardly thinking about it because that's what you've been practicing this entire time. It'll become easier for you to approach your boss and your database administrator with the truth about the fact that you just resized and downsized a column in a big table and 
Now transaction log is filling up and the database is going down and help desk calls are ringing off the hook. And I, I, I don't know who, who would have ever come up with that idea, but this guy figured out, he, he surmised that, well, I extended the column size from 1024 to 2048 and nothing bad happened. So I figure it works the same way the other direction. So if I downsize that column with millions of records in it, it shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. And for 30 minutes, we, the, the college was out of a primary SQL database. Um, and I mean, you wanna bring that thing back up, you need to have some transparency. You need to be willing to practice some humility. That's a very humiliating time, right? You need to practice some honesty. Why? Because, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, just honestly, um, it's an, yeah, sure, it's an opportunity to learn from our mistakes, but I think I would like to think that by practicing these things um, in a situation like that, there's more inclination that to, to believe that I might have a job tomorrow. <laughs> okay. And so um, these are important things. It's hard to come forward with things like this, but the more we practice, the more we are, uh, uh, you know, contributing to the quality of our work and who we are as professionals, practicing integrity, practicing patience. These I know are high level things, but they have a, there's a, as with foundational things, as I say, even in, in development is that foundation is so critical. It, what we decide today, what we decide to invest into our foundations, even as developers, it's going to have long lasting ramifications, but it becomes easier for us. If we set our minds to practice excellence, it'll become easier for us to achieve excellence through reason of use. How do you wake up early? Well, you get to bed early, you, you know, make sure everything is, well, you wake up early. Where's this from? Does anybody know? It's from our friend, former Navy SEAL commander, Jocko. <clears throat> and so I say this, that in practice, principles are opportunities to choose who we are today and who we will become tomorrow by what we practice. These are opportunities that we have to practice who we are about. Who are we about? What are, why do you do what you do? We've heard this said that it is better to do one thing well than to do many things mediocrely. <clears throat> mediocrely, I had to do some uh, research on this because I was like, I'm better, I'm not sure if this is actually a word, but it is. Um, the word mediocre is, is kind of an interesting uh, word. Uh, it's somewhat of a, this idea of a compound word with Latin origin uh, comprised of that word medius in that first part, which is pretty straightforward. We know that we, we use that. That's where we get the word medium, median, things having to do with in the middle. A uh, thought that came to mind uh, over the weekend was just uh, how, you know, I don't know about you, if you like steak if, and, how, and if you do, how you like your steak done. Um, I actually like mine medium well. I'll do somewhat medium, but I like mine medium well. And to me, if I go to some uh, undisclosed restaurant to get a nice 14 ounce ribeye, I'm going to ask them to do it medium or medium well. And if they come out with a medium or medium well steak, my response to that, as I sink my teeth into that, if that thing has been seasoned well and it's like legit medium well, I'm going to say, this is perfect. This is perfect. To me, it's complete. It completes my expectations of what I was hoping for. And I just thought that was interesting because even in a context of medium halfway, I can put my value on that and say, this is perfect. This completes my life. This 14 ounce ribeye that is medium completes my expectations. And we move on. Well, the second part of the word mediocre comes from this word acris, which means rugged mountain. And it's like, well, what on earth is a rugged mountain doing in this word mediocre? It doesn't quite make sense to me until you put the two together. You have this word mediocris uh, or our more common use of the word today, mediocre. 
And you put those two together and you get this idea of only going halfway up the mountain, being at the middle point of the mountain or halfway up to the highest point of excellence. You remember what I said, the objective for this lecture and the objective for software engineering is as defined by University of Nevada, the employment of these concepts, theories, tools, principles that can be used to produce mediocre software. No, to produce high quality professional software. And so this is the goal. This is the, 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 the picture of our, what if, if, again, if this is what you aspire to, to be, to do, to scale that to the top, okay, then we have to look at these principles. We have to go a little bit above and beyond just our day-to-day -day development. And so um, there's a story here. I'm not, I'm going to leave off on this for, for now, but um, there was a, there's a story about a, a couple eighth graders who put a sticker on their teacher's fish tank glass and got yelled at because um, they learned later on that it was extremely difficult to remove that. And the results that were left behind was um, very becoming of, of mediocre. Um, <clears throat> they didn't have the right tools to remove it professionally. So this image here reminds me of what I've been taught um, as back when I used to do choir, um, I was a choir director at a couple of churches and then also in, in music. Um, I've been, I've heard this, I've talked about this to other people and I've been, you know, um, it's kind of been generally agreed upon that in a music piece, when, you know, you have, a, um, you have an individual who's like maybe on the piano and they're learning their parts if that director or that orchestra, whatever, whoever it is, hears that they're playing a measure incorrectly or they're playing a note incorrectly or it's supposed to be, you know, this note or that chord or this uh, uh, variation and they're playing something different, it is just generally understood that the sooner you can get that out of them, the better because once they start to practice that in that piece, it's almost impossible to get that out of them. And, and it's very difficult to untrain what has already been practiced. And so, um, you know, for better or for worse, you will perfect what it is that you are practicing. We say practice makes perfect. What we mean is we want good results. We want the benefit. But at the end of the day, we need to be careful to qualify and push forward what we really mean is we want good results. We, you know, and so, um, this is about, this is what the whole emphasis about the, what is all about that. And, and we see here the, that principles by themselves as standalone ideas and concepts are powerful and they drive far, they hit hard, but when combined, especially when combined with their risks or their inverses or whatever, we see that this is somewhat of a force to be reckoned with, that if you practice only scaling to halfway up the mountain, that's where you're going to live. That's where you're going to hang out. That's where you're going to spend most of your time. And so even if we are practicing mediocrity, that is what we are getting more efficient at doing. That's what we are spending less time accepting. I tell my developers this, um, some of these, again, this is not all of them. Um, just a handful of them, but at a point in time when, when these guys were being onboarded, you know, and I was just kind of dragging them through the mud of, of some of these principles right out of the gate. One of the things I said is that everything is important. Everything is important. You see, I understand that for high level people, not everything, you know, it, they have time for all, you know, getting into the weeds as they, as they say. Um, but as developers in the boiler room, as people, you and I, who are in the trenches you know, doing the daily grind as engineers, we have to concern ourselves with the details of what is in the weeds and everything becomes important. I say, I said this to them, you know, that as full stack developers, which they are, because we concern ourselves with everything from database design uh, and, and um, you know, the designing of those tables, the columns, the, the parameters of that, all the way up to the user interface and user experience um, and everything in between. Okay, as full stack developers, you are responsible for everything. 
So you need to give attention to detail in even the littlest things that perceptively or, per, per, you know, whatever, um, nobody cares about. Okay. And so then I tell them, you know, you need to strive for excellence in, in everything that you do. Even the mundane things that just, it's like, I don't want to take the time to do this as following principles. We should, we should. Um, there was a time um, in an organization's history at one point involving a team. And this is a real story. This story has been redacted for the purpose of this lecture. So names are being subbed out here, but uh, there was a, there was a, a point in history in this organization's uh, time when this team will call them for sake of uh, illustration team Delta was offered or was submitted to a, a task that typically took them about five minutes, maybe 10 minutes on a bad day to complete. So th because it's something they've been doing for a very long time. And so this request goes to team Delta and they, however, um, they know that it only takes a few minutes to commit to fulfill the actual request, but they have come to a point in time where they actually, uh, they, they built around a pro around this uh, request, uh, a process, a protocol for just some additional checks, some additional quality checks that are necessary that became necessary, especially in this event. And so because of the existence of that protocol, it would actually real time take upwards of 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes, let's say 30 minutes on a bad day. Okay. So that's the breakdown, if you will, of fulfilling this task. So they go to work and um, following protocol, they find there is an issue with this request. Houston, we have a problem. <clears throat> In this scenario, Team Delta was no decision maker. They were just entrusted with gatekeeping responsibilities. And so they offer from their position and from their expertise an advisory saying, this is an issue. Here's what the issue is. Here's proposed remediation steps. Uh, we strongly advise that you remediate this before moving on. But because they're not decision makers, this could have fallen out one of two ways. One, it could have been take, taken the path of remediation, or number two, it could have taken the path of override. It could have gone over Team Delta, and it could have been pushed through. And again, uh, somebody could have stepped in and said, we need this now. We want this now. This is time sensitive. This is mission critical. And leave off the protocol. Fortunately, it took the path of remediation, which just to uh, summarize for you, what should have taken 20, 30 minutes on a bad day by one personnel, uh, again, because they have done this for so long, by following protocol as they were inclined to do because it was important to them, they, that original task ended up taking a period of 14 business days or five weeks, plus an additional four business days for debriefing and data cleanup, also involving more than just the individual uh, fulfilling the request, but uh, members of a uh, network. Um, it, it was uh, one network admin, two, three system administrators, two directors, one security personnel, two technology liaisons were all involved in the remediation effort because of what Team Delta detected in this request, just following their day-to-day -day mundane process. And that's not what made this impactful. That's not what made this profound. What made this significant was that the affected audience that was on hold involved all cascading members in an organization tree that was attempting to use this service up through T minus one week before their own deadlines which was then followed up by just basically this, this broad global announcements explaining why this 30 minute task took five weeks plus to fulfill. And this was not five weeks twilling their thumbs. This was these multiple people actively involved in remediating this issue. And again, even that I would say was not the profound thing to it. To me, what really stood out about this fiasco, if you will, 
was that there were key people who had the authority to, as I have been saying recently, who understood and these key people who had the authority to put important people on hold so that important things can get done. Had this uh, uh, this team's operation, they're like their standard operating procedures, what they did all the time without hardly thinking about it, been overridden. There was enough evidence in this situation to warrant the position that it could have led to an organization wide data breach with no respect of data classifications, whether that was public data, internal data, restricted data, uh, what have you. And so everything is important when you. When, 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 again, high quality professionalism, high quality professional software, high quality professional output, high quality professional services is your objective, is your goal, then everything needs to be treated as important. And again, it's by what we practice that we, that we get good and efficient at these things. And we don't necessarily have to be negatively impacted by the cost that it is to us because we become efficient, we get better, we get faster at doing the important things. This is a favorite of mine as we wind this down here. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. I had a guy tell me once, well, just because you can doesn't mean you shouldn't. And it really spoke to the mentality from which that was coming, it wasn't, in my opinion, coming from a place of desiring or aspiring for excellence because of these preceding things and the things that we had seen over the years. There's reason for principles. There's reason for why we do what we do. There's a reason for why it takes me so long to give a simple yes or no answer sometimes to my guys when they say, should I do this? Could I do this? And I've got to break open a lot of the history or some of the history, some of the reasons why we have to take this more tedious path. Just another real world example. I can't tell you how many times I've been told this. I could probably tell you how many times, but more than one time is probably too many times. How My garbage disposal company has told me explicitly, do not put ashes in the garbage can. Do not put, I said, what about cold ashes? I'll, I'll make sure they're out. Do not put cold ashes in the garbage can. And I share this with people and it just astounds me two things. One, that people would say, well, I don't know how they would know that you put cold ashes in the garbage can. And then the, the other second thing that really astounds me even more is how fast they whip out that response as if it's something that they've been practicing and have gotten really good at. And they could just form that conclusion that I don't know how they'll know that they put that you put cold ashes in the garbage can. Well, I come to the realization what the answer to that question is or to that debate, that argument is. And here it is. They're not going to know. They're not going to know. For all they know. That your ash, the, the cold ashes you put into the garbage can could be from the next county over. And I think it, 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 it it's, goes without saying, you know, is that, is that right to do? Well, here's, here's the thing. Principles, okay? Risk mitigation, risk management. Your definition of cold ashes realistically in the real world does not necessarily is not necessarily going to be a 100% fit compatible fit with someone else's definition of cold ashes your definition of cold ashes as an excellent professional is these are ashes from last winter they've been rained on it's been hailed on it's been snowed on it's been iced over it's cold. I put my hand through all of it. I sifted it out. It, I've drenched it for two weeks. It is cold ashes. That's your, you as an excellent professional, you know, these are cold ashes. These are never setting on fire. But somebody who only goes up halfway the mountain, their definition of cold ashes is, I don't see any yellow. I don't see any red. I don't see any orange. 
And they put that in and the house next door goes up in flames, which did happen in my neighborhood right next door to me. Okay. So for the disposal company to continue to provide you with the services that you require on a weekly basis, and I don't work for them, by the way, I'm just imagining that this is a reason why they just reach for a common principle or a guideline that just makes it easy for everyone to comply. It makes it easy for them to mitigate that risk and just saying, you know what, we're not even going to bother with the degree scale of what cold ashes mean. Just don't do it. And this way they're not able, they, they don't need to necessarily worry about the risks involved. And it really simplifies our lives, all of us, because we just, we just don't do it. And people generally are safer for it by following that principle or this guideline, whatever, whatever it is. <clears throat> you know, as a developer, you know, as a privileged personnel in the areas that you work, you know, as an engineer, how to access something without permission undetected. You know how to make a change to a system without reporting it, without accounting for it, without managing that change, without following a change management process. You know how to do certain things. You know how to get away with certain things. You've thought about it. We've all thought about that scenario, especially in cybersecurity. We have to think about those scenarios because we have to think about what our attackers are thinking about in order for us to respond and prepare and defend efficiently. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can take shortcuts, just because you can protect, practice all the things on the left, there's a difference between license and excellence. And so we reach for excellence when given the opportunity. Always for opportunity, winding this down right now. Not necessarily a principle, but just the impact. Okay, three things that attackers and defenders share in common. Number one, the opportunity to act. Number two, the effort that it takes to succeed. And it's a lot of effort. And number three, the audacity to commit. Our attackers already are committed. They already know the effort. They've been practicing that for a while and they found ways to automate it. I see it in our logs all the time, all day long, every day. It gets to be old and annoying after a while. Question is, what are we, when presented with these opportunities to secure ourselves, to do our due diligence, are we taking those opportunities the same way our adversaries are? At the end of the day, I hold this view that others may never hold you accountable, but there's one person who can, and that's you. Thank you again for your time, guys. I appreciate it. Um, there on the screen. If uh, you have any additional questions afterwards, I know we got to wrap up. Um, that's my email address slash web address. Uh, the .dev domains, along with a bunch of others, are now valid as of a few years ago. There is a link to the slides out there um, under the presentations link or uh, email address. Um, you're welcome to reach out if anything comes out up later on uh, that you didn't think to ask now. Um, I'm open to, to fielding those questions. Um, anything at madborha.dev will get to the same place. You know, principles at madborha.dev, this class sucks at madborha.dev. You've been at this a while. Here's a million dollars, go retire early at madborha.dev, whatever. Um, that all goes to the same place. Lastly, real quick, for those of you who are interested in uh, this and sort of a certificate of completion for this lesson, again, that we are only halfway up the mountain. I'll tell you that right now. With the amount of principles that we cover, we're only halfway up the mountain. There's more to cover, but for today, uh, this uh, can be redeemed for a digital certificate of completion. You can scan this QR code, fill out a form, just provide your name as you want it spelled on the certificate. You'll receive that uh, at the email address you provide signed, as well as this digital asset that is shown a preview here. Um, I've never done vector art before, but this is a lot of fun. And so you'll also um, get what I'm calling a digital challenge coin uh, issued to you, exclusive license and signed by myself. Uh, just something you could use for, um, uh, you know, a badge or digital, uh, um, as, as like digital swag. We have another colleague who started collecting this recent, recently for another recognition um, or, or a certificate of completion for this course, just showing that you were here today. So with that, Guys, appreciate your time and thank you for coming. 
Yeah, if we don't talk to you. Let's open it up to questions. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions with our live audience? First is, is Yavapai College still using object-oriented programming? Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> oh, yes. All day, every day, for days. Yep. Um, our, our technology stack in our area is um, ASP.NET MVC is our web application framework, and C Sharp is our language, which is heavy, heavy object-oriented. 